Club. The heat is on between former President Trump and the Justice Department over the FBI raid of his Florida home. Like many Republicans and Democrats, Trump is calling for the release of the search warrant, and it's expected to be made public very soon. Reports are circulating that Trump kept classified nuclear information after he left office. Trump's attorneys are pushing back against accusations that the former president was hiding anything, saying that he's been fully cooperating with the government's requests. George Thomas has the story. In a message posted online late Thursday evening, the former president called for the immediate release of the FBI warrant used to search his Florida home, saying the raid was un-American, unwarranted and politically motivated. Hours earlier, Attorney General Merrick Garland, who said he personally approved the search, asked a court to take the rare step of unsealing the details of the warrant, despite a pending investigation. Garland making a statement without taking questions from the media. The department filed the motion to make public the warrant and receipt in light of the former president's public confirmation of the search, the surrounding circumstances, and the substantial public interest in this matter. Garland had been facing demands to explain the circumstances surrounding the raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence Monday. The attorney general has faced mounting pressure in the last few days uh, from Republicans and Democrats alike. Republicans have been rallying around Trump following the FBI raid, criticizing the attorney general for personally approving it. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted, the primary reason the attorney general and FBI are being pushed to disclose why the search was necessary is because of the deep mistrust of the FBI and DOJ when it comes to all things Trump. Media reports say that Trump was subpoenaed earlier this year for taking classified material from the White House, as the government believed he was holding on to sensitive information with national security implications. According to the Washington Post, classified documents relating to nuclear weapons were among the items FBI agents were searching for at Trump's residence. A Trump attorney pushing back against accusations that the former president was hiding something, saying the Trump team has been very cooperative. All documents requested were previously handed over. President Trump and his team painstakingly reviewed every single document at Mar-a-Lago and gave the government what they requested. If they and, and needed any other documents, they could have just asked. While some have focused on the details of the search warrant, others want to see the affidavit that gave the reason for why the warrant was issued. The warrant itself is sort of the conclusions. It describes the parameters of the search. What we want to know is why this search was ordered, what was told to the court, and did they reveal that there had been cooperation with the first subpoena? Now, with the former president himself encouraging the release of the warrant and the growing leaks to the media about why the search was ordered, Americans should soon learn more about why the FBI carried out an unprecedented raid on the home of a former president. George Thomas, CBN News. What a week. What a week in Washington, D.C. And, of course, over recent months, as many Republicans are trying to decide, you know, should Trump run again, should he not? Is it time for some fresh blood? I don't think there's any doubt right now that Trump is a leading contender because of what David Brody, our chief political analyst, said just a few days ago on this show. Trump has become a sympathetic figure to many who would never have thought of him that way just a few weeks ago. Well, in other news, congressional Democrats are set to pass their major economic bill today over very strong Republican objections. And Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim. Andrew, Democrats are set to pass the bill through the closely divided House of Representatives today. The measure focuses on more spending on issues like climate change and health care subsidies. It also includes more than $3 billion in new taxes on businesses. Democrats are hoping the bill will be a political win for them going into the midterm elections. And with inflation as the top issue going into those elections, Democrats have named the bill the Inflation Reduction Act. But a poll from YouGov found 36 percent of those surveyed believe the measure will increase inflation, while only 12 percent said it will decrease inflation. Studies by independent analysts have said the measure will have no real impact on inflation. Major American cities face a perfect storm. Violent crime is growing and law enforcement agencies are struggling to keep officers on the job. 
In an unprecedented move, police departments are bringing faith to the front lines, working to build stronger and safer communities. CBN's Brody Carter brings us this story. 786. In Gresham, Oregon, Sergeant Travis Garrison says a crime spike is forcing his department to choose which calls and crimes they can send officers. We're only able to investigate murders. Um, we'll routine, routinely respond to shootings, um, but if the person is going to survive, we are not going to follow up on that. Triaging or prioritizing first responders is becoming commonplace. In Philadelphia, police disbanded its abandoned car unit, while in Los Angeles, police cut their homeless outreach and animal cruelty teams. This is going to take years for us to recover from, and my hope is that the, the people that I work with, that they stick it out. As a growing number of police walk away from the job, violent crime still surges in several major U.S. cities. As a potential solution, departments are now turning to houses of worship. They're hoping faith will help reduce this trend. That there is a power greater than ourselves that is in control. Tuesday, more than 25 law enforcement groups joined prominent faith leaders on Capitol Hill, inviting communities to participate in the National Faith in Blue Weekend. Dr. Reverend Markel Hutchins, head of Movement Forward, started this event about five years ago in Atlanta. He knows firsthand that one weekend can spark change. With crime and violence escalating, with our communities under siege and under attack, our best march at this moment is not against law enforcement, but it's with law enforcement. And that's what faith-based faith -based, uh, communities are positioned to do. In early October, Faith in Blue will seek to reinvigorate police community relations through town halls peace walks, picnics, and other activities nationwide. That's what this is all about. It's all about activating local communities to raise the voices of the silent majority. Chief Patrick Ogden sees these partnerships as key to building stronger and safer communities. Policing uh, is much greater than law enforcement. The enforcement piece is just a piece of what we do, and we can't arrest our way out of this problem. So we really need to collaborate with leaders in the communities to try to do educational programming, outreach, try to uh, you know build that trust so people report crimes in a timely fashion so that we don't just have crime going on and on and on. Brody Carter, CBN News. Turning overseas now to the Middle East, when it comes to the heart of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the same question of whose land it is keeps coming up. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, a new documentary goes back in history to answer this pressing question. For many around the world, including the United Nations, Israel is an occupier on land stolen from Palestinians. They often chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, and Yaffa. This is part of the strategy to delegitimize Israel. Um, not only is there a, a, a biblical mandate for the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, but there's a legal foundation as well. Producer Hugh Kitson's new film, Whose Land, disputes the accusation Israel is illegitimate by stating a legal foundation established more than 100 years ago. At the 1920 San Remo Conference, the victors of World War I divided the Middle East. The result included a British mandate, re-establishing a homeland for the Jews. The preamble states, whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. I believe actually what happened at San Remo and in the mandate back in the early 1920s was God putting the title deed of the land of Israel to the Jewish people and enshrining it international law. Colonel Richard Kemp, former commander of British forces in Afghanistan, narrates the film. You frequently get the narrative that Israel has no legitimacy, Israel is occupying territory. And this film shows that that's not the case. It shows that the Israel's sovereign territory is, is legally its sovereign territory. And it is not illegally occupying anything. It is not, there are no illegal settlements. There is just a false narrative against the state of Israel based on falsehoods. 
Camp adds many Jews and Christians need to know the true story of Israel's legal right to the land. And I think this story, this film, plays a major role in educating people about the truth and about what the reality is compared to the narrative that is shoved down everyone's throat by the media, by some human rights groups, by the United Nations, by the EU and various other international bodies. The film cites other experts, including international law professor Avi Bell. Simply putting out the basic facts about what happened to whom when, why it is the Jewish people have legal and historical and moral rights to their homeland in Israel. It turns out this is of fundamental importance. It should be obvious, but it's not. Many, including the Biden administration, continue to push a two-state solution as a resolution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The long history of Palestinians rejecting this proposal leads Kemp to believe it's not what they want. In the meantime, he says, the campaign to delegitimize Israel carries global implications. It not only does it affect Israel, it, it, it kind of discredits Israel's reputation for those people who believe it, but it also fuels and incites Jew hate around the world. And we've seen examples of that in the United Kingdom, in the United States and other European countries, mm -hmm. all fueled by this anti-Israel narrative based on lies. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. History holds the truth and the answers. Andrew. All right, thank you, Ephraim and Chris. And to find out where you can see the documentary, Whose Land Is It?, you can go to our website, cbnnews.com, and there's more information for you there. Well, I'm sure you know the children in America spend a huge chunk of their day staring at screens on their phones and other electronic devices. And for some, it's an addiction that can follow them into adulthood. That's why one mother took a drastic step and pulled the plug on her children's devices. Jenna Browder brings us the results of this family's digital detox. It's the day and age we live in. Technology rules, and sometimes we just need a break. And that's especially true for kids. We had noticed some behaviors in our kids after screen time that we didn't really like. Just ask Molly DeFrank, mother of six, all under the age of 12. And it wasn't until we fully pulled the plug on all of their screen entertainment, cold turkey, we gave them a break. And it wasn't until we did that that it was like removing a filter from our kids. We finally got our kids back, and ever since we have made that decision, I've been helping other parents do the same thing. Her new book, Digital Detox, begins by taking parents step-by-step -step through a two-week cold turkey detox for their kids. Talk to us a little bit about some of your strategies to you know, cut back on screen time for parents. I think a lot of parents are kind of at a loss. They don't know what, what to do here. You're absolutely right. You know, most of the parents I help are great parents of amazing kids, and they're already working to monitor their kids' screen time. They're taking away time for bad behavior. They're adding some back, and they're finding it's still not working. Molly says it comes down to brain chemistry. Too much screen time creates excessive levels of dopamine in the brain, the kind that can be addicting. And for kids, it's a problem that can follow them well into their adult lives. What you're actually doing is you're resetting your kids' dopamine levels. Because when they're scrolling, when they're playing, when they're tapping, their, their dopamine levels in their brains are excessively high. So real life can't compare. That's why they're complaining of boredom. But when you give them this two-week window to reset those levels back down to real life, you're giving them time to rekindle a love of, of real life activities. Things like playing outside, arts and crafts, reading and writing. The second half of the book helps parents come up with a long-term strategy using their observations from the detox period. So how often should families do a detox? And it's going to be unique for every family and child. So once you kind of get that calibrated right for your kids and your family, um, you should be good for a while. But there have been families who it's gotten out of place again and they've done another detox. And this is great. In fact, a lot of these Silicon Valley engineers and CEOs, they'll give themselves dopamine breaks too. So this is very yeah. science-based and the results are really, really, the proof's in the pudding. Molly says for most families like hers, it's not about eliminating technology, just making sure it's in its right place. And most parents find pretty much every parent who's reported results back to me has said that their kids get along better. They find new real life productive hobbies and they're happier their mental health is better. It's just across the board beneficial to these kids. Her own kids are a testament to that. In just two weeks, she says they were free from the grip of technology. Mood shifted. Creativity exploded. 
and they learned how to entertain themselves and enjoy life without screens. And yours can too. Molly says it can be difficult at first, but giving your kids a break from technology is something that will pay off for them and the entire family for years to come. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Great story. You know, I, I have kids, so I can say this. I think a lot of this just really starts with us as parents. If you're a parent like me that sometimes has been scrolling my phone and turning to my kid and saying, why are you still on your phone? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's where it starts, right? I mean, I took a little grief from some people in my family because I put some time limits on some apps and internet, you know, time I can have. Just a reminder goes off. Gosh, I've, okay, I've been on this for 15 minutes a day. Like, it does bring you back to how much time am I spending on this app or device? And if our children see us on our phones constantly, what can we really anticipate or expect from them? So as we're looking at having device control for our kids, uh, we as parents should do the same, right? Terry, it's true. Well, you know that for a lot of us, our phone is both personal and business. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we're raising a granddaughter and I find myself doing the personal. And then when she'll come over to me later in the evening, I'm really doing business, but she doesn't discern between the two. So you're right. We really need to be wise about how we utilize yeah, I often find myself doing the business and then, oh, let's do yeah. the personal. And then you like the next thing you know, Facebook. Yeah, the next, I did the same stuff that was there yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday, you know, yeah, exactly. people. Here's my memory. I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's all try and discipline ourselves. Indeed, indeed. Natalie Valcarcel wasn't pregnant, but she definitely looked like she was. For more than five years, Natalie had a massive fibroid tumor inside that kept growing and growing. Eventually, it reached 18 pounds and threatened to end Natalie's life. I had been having pain in my stomach and it would be so bad that it would kind of put me to the floor. <clears throat> Doctors couldn't find the source of Natalie Valcarcel's occasional but intense bouts of abdominal pain. In 2005, two months before her wedding, one of those attacks sent her to the ER where an ultrasound revealed a three centimeter fibroid tumor on her uterus. She assured me that women have this all the time and that it's not a big deal. So since she didn't worry about it, I didn't worry about it either. But the tumor started causing more and more discomfort. So months after her wedding to Paul, she went in for surgery to have it removed. 30 minutes later, the surgeon came out to tell Paul the tumor had grown from three centimeters to 15. She showed me two photos and it looked like the size of maybe like a cantaloupe. And she points to this she's a little bump on this cantaloupe looking tumor and says, you see that little bump? That's actually her uterus. The tumor is completely encompassing the uterus. So she says, there's just no way to be able to remove the tumor without having to move, remove the uterus. They stopped the procedure and the couple went home to discuss whether to go through with the hysterectomy. A few days later, her doctor called, insisting that it was her only option. Don't hold on to any hope for having children. It is impossible. And this tumor needs to be removed. It's very dangerous. We just need to do this hysterectomy. Right when she told me that, I hung up and I was mad. I was angry. I didn't like that that was being taken away from me. I went to the Lord right away and I said, God, what is your will in this? What do you want? What do you want to do? I told Natalie, I said, you know, I can believe the Lord will take this tumor completely away. However he wants to do it, however he's going to do it, you have to decide for yourself what you're able to, to believe for and I'm going to believe with you. Natalie says God reminded her of Psalm 128, the blessing that was read at their wedding. She looked it up, and one verse stood out. Your wife will be a fruitful vine in the innermost parts of her home, and she will see her children around her table like olive plants. And then I was like, that is for me. And I held on to it, and I didn't let it go. Natalie declined the hysterectomy. For the next five years, the couple tried to get pregnant as the tumor continued to grow. It got so large, people thought she was pregnant. I would just say, no, I'm not pregnant. It's a fibroid tumor. 
and they're just like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, I know what I look like. I am believing for a miracle and I'm waiting for a promise. God has promised me that I would have a child. Meanwhile, doctors kept insisting she have the procedure because now the mass was pressing into her organs and could cause kidney or heart failure. With the prayer and support of family and friends, Natalie and Paul constantly asked God for guidance. I asked him specifically, do I do the hysterectomy or I don't? And he said no. And every time I went to the Lord regarding it, he told me no. I had times where it was really hard. And I just went on my face before the Lord until I got peace back again. And when I got that peace, I was so confident that the Lord was in this. It's not easy. It never is. When it's walking by faith and just really the Lord doing it through you, the less and less you really consider your abilities and just rely on His. Then one Sunday at church, Natalie stopped to greet her pastor before taking her seat. Later in the service, he announced that God had revealed something to him. He said, this girl doesn't even know that I'm talking about her right now. And he says, but when I shook her hand, the Lord said pregnant. And he turned to me and he said, Natalie, this is you. And he says, and the Lord says to you right now, nothing's impossible with him. Then in April 2011, while out with Paul on her birthday, Natalie believed the impossible had come true. She was like, you know, I think I want to go home. As a matter of fact, let's go stop by the Rite Aid and get a pregnancy test. And I'm like, what? <laughs> pregnancy test? Just as Natalie suspected, the test was positive. I was ecstatic. I was just like, I knew he would do, <laughs> I knew he'd follow through. But with the tumor putting Natalie and the baby at risk, she started seeing Dr. Douglas Montgomery, who specialized in high-risk pregnancies. He made sure the couple understood what those risks were. We would, would lose the baby or have an extreme premature birth of the baby or have a medical complication of Natalie where we can't continue the pregnancy. Her life's in jeopardy. The baby's pre-viable. We need to deliver the baby to save Natalie's life. Then at 28 weeks, one of many possible complications arose. Natalie developed a blood clot in her leg. And it was at that point that I was concerned for her life because if that blood clot were to break off and go to her lungs, it was large enough where she could die from what we call a saddle pulmonary embolus. And so that was very concerning to me at that time. So even though I'm getting in the natural, all these things are going to happen to you, you're gonna die, it doesn't look good, it doesn't. The Lord's telling me, no, you're not going to die. You are healthy, you are whole. Dr. Montgomery decided to transfer Natalie to the ICU at Los Angeles Medical Center, where she would be monitored 24 seven in case the clot broke loose. For now, he put her on a mild blood thinner to keep it from getting worse. He told me that he didn't want me to die that's what it's looking like. And I told him, Dr. Montgomery, I'm not going to die. I did not come this far for this to end this way. The next time you'll see me, I will be holding my baby tumor free. Once there, Paul stayed by her side, fasting and praying for his wife and unborn child. I have to get before the Lord because I don't know what to do. I know what I feel the Lord is saying. I know what the doctors are saying, and then I feel, you know, the tug and pull of faith versus fear. After two weeks, one of Natalie's doctors came in with results from an ultrasound. The clot was gone. So when she told me, oh, that heifer must have worked, and I said, but you told me that it would not take the blood clot away. You told me it would just keep it from getting bigger. And she's like, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And I said, I know, it was God. On October 19th, 2011, Heaven Faith Valcarcel was born by a C-section, weighing three pounds, 13 ounces. She was so real and it was so God. It was very surreal. This has been done completely by his promise. It was impossible in the natural, but 
In the spirit, it was possible. Just being a first time dad, being with a little girl, it was, you know, it was awesome. Two months later, Natalie had the hysterectomy to remove the tumor, which had grown to 18 pounds. The real remarkable part of this is Natalie's faith, not through, through one pregnancy, but yet through five to six years, and then to take on all of the negative comments that come on with all the risks that she had to face. And I really am struck by how God worked through her and brought that. She built my faith during this. Heaven is a healthy little girl who loves Jesus. For Natalie and Paul, she's living proof that God hears their prayers. We believe in a God who has done greater, and you know, he did it in Jesus, and he just says, just believe me, just trust me, see me, know me, because we can't do it all on our own. Jesus is the answer to everything, and because I know I can trust in his promises, I trusted him all the way. He's the only one who can pull you through something like this. You know, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? She's right. Jesus is the answer to everything. But sometimes it's hard to hang on to that. I just look at her in the middle of everything she's hearing from professionals. And yet she stands on the word that God has given her. We want to stand with you today for whatever your need, whatever your situation might be. You know, there is power in the word of God. And one of the things she said that is so key to me to finding your healing is trust him. Trust him, trust him. Don't trust even yourself, trust him, because he is the one who has the ability, the capacity, the power to change your situation. So grab hold of a word if it's given to you. Grab hold of faith as people are praying for you. That's what Andrew and I want to do today. We want to pray together with you for whatever your circumstance might be. And we have some answers to prayer to further build your faith. This is Louisiana. She was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and prepared prepared for the surgery, then her husband, Willie, called CBN's prayer line. He received prayer for Gladys' complete healing and speedy recovery. When Gladys had the surgery, the doctors were stunned. There was no cancer to remove, and the couple gives all the glory to God. Amen. Amen. Here's Antoinette of Greenfield, Indiana, had a serious issue with her eyes. Treatments included getting shots in both eyes year after year. Oh, my. Listen to this. Even so, she still completely lost her vision. She decided to call the CBN prayer line for intercession, and after praying with CBN, she called back five days later to report she can now see again. Her sight is restored. Really? It's like something wow. you read in the Gospels, it isn't is. it? That's wonderful. Well, let's pray. I just, yeah. I, I know the Holy Spirit wants to do great work today. Jesus. And Terry and I want to pray for you. It's our privilege, and please join with us. Father God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving, with expectation, some of us with desperation and others with joy. Lord, you know the condition of all our hearts, and we just pray your Holy Spirit moves now in the name of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. And there's someone who uh, has so much trouble hearing. You have this show on such a high volume, other people would just not even understand why you have the volume up so high. And the Lord's going to heal your hearing now and restore it, and you're going to be quite taken aback by this. But just receive that. The Lord is working in your ear right now in Jesus' name. There's someone named Mary, and I, I don't know what your request is, but you have been crying out to God for some time for a specific thing. In fact, this is not a woman. This is a man whose name is Mary. And, and God is wanting you to know that answer is on its way. It's already in process. Just begin to praise him for it and thank him for it. One with such despair that now uh, you find yourself consuming alcohol in the mornings. It's just, you're just so desperate and feel so unworthy because now your drinking addiction is, is now is starting in the mornings as you start your day and you're scared. And greater is, you're a believer, greater is he who is in you than is in this world. Jesus wants to deliver you from this and he wants to do it in a joyful way hand in hand with you in the name of Jesus. Just lift your hands to him. Do not fear. He wants to deliver you from this. And he is delivering you from this addiction alcohol in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I feel like on the heels of Andrew's word, there, is, there are numbers of you who have addictions. You are believers. And you are so, oh, 
You're so disappointed in yourself. You're so disgusted with your situation. Today, be set free. Reach up right now. Just take the hand of Jesus as he touches you, frees you from that addiction. You'll have it no more. Jesus said, the one the sun sets free is free indeed. And today, that is yours. Take it and begin to thank him. Coming against the spirit of suicide uh, for one who believes this is an actual option now. You've been looking at choices on how to handle something, and you're looking at suicide as an option. The Lord speaks life over you today and not death, and so do Terry and I. We speak life over you in the name of Jesus. Just receive his spirit who wants to fill you up now with hope. You are loved. You are loved. We rebuke that spirit of death, and we speak life to you. Receive that now in Jesus' name. Receive the sonship that is yours with the Father and with your Savior, that you are much loved, you are rejoiced over. Even in our sin we are, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not because you perform for him. He loves you as you are. He wants to change the things in you that need changing. Receive that in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for meeting with us. And we thank you that long after this program ends, you still hear our prayers. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We want to remind you, if you've had an answer to prayer or you'd like prayer, you can give us a call at 800-700-7000. CBN is built on a foundation of prayer. And we want to pray for you and hear your good reports. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The school board in Fargo, North Dakota, has voted to stop saying the Pledge of Allegiance before its meetings because it isn't, quote, inclusive. Board Vice President Seth Holden said, given that the word God in the text of the Pledge of Allegiance is capitalized, the text clearly is referring to the Judeo-Christian God, and therefore it does not include any other faiths, such as Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of which are practiced by our staff and students. He added it also does not include those who don't believe in God. You can find out more about this story at CBNNews.com. In addition to sending aid to victims recovering from the devastating floods in Kentucky, CBN's Operation Blessing also helped to provide help to the elderly after flooding in Virginia. Buchanan County was hit hard with torrential rains back in July. The flash floods left huge amounts of mud and debris under Mrs. Beulah Lamy's mobile home. That was a risk to the trailer's foundation and prevented the power from being restored. Operation Blessings disaster relief team and volunteers diligently cleared the debris to protect the structure and make the home accessible to restore electricity. Bueller's daughter, Julie Clifton, said there were things under the trailer they would have never been able to remove without that help. And she thanked God, saying without Operation Blessing, quote, I don't know where we would be right now. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Well, Pat Boone is a legendary superstar whose career has spanned more than half a century. In the late 1950s, he was a teen idol rivaling Elvis Presley hit for hit. Over the years, he has sold more than 45 million records, had 38 top 40 hits, and appeared in more than 12 Hollywood films. So what does Pat Boone say is his greatest accomplishment? Just watch. Legendary recording artist and entertainer Pat Boone has sold over 45 million records worldwide and recorded over 2,000 songs. He has starred in major films and hobnobbed with celebrities, presidents, and prime ministers. Despite his awards and accolades, he says his greatest accomplishment was made in his 30s when he embarked on a spiritual quest. In his latest book, If, Pat shares the simple truths that he discovered on his journey that can help you in making the biggest decision of your life. Well, it is our pleasure to welcome back a dear friend of CBN and the 700 Club, our dear friend, Pat Boone. Pat, welcome back. Hello, Andrew. Good to talk to you again on the channel I consider the most important television channel in the world. And I don't say that, you know, in an exaggerated way, I believe it. We are the light of the world in this channel. Well, we appreciate that, and we appreciate you being with us. Look, Pat, we have barely scratched the surface of your amazing, legendary career. So looking back, what do you believe is your greatest accomplishment? Well, greatest accomplishment is, I think, my marriage of 67 years 
uh, raising four beautiful daughters and now having 16 uh, grandkids and over 17 uh, great grandkids and in Hollywood, California, making movies and all that stuff in the entertainment field, what is really, and it was only with the Lord's help right by our side and in our home that made that possible. So I feel my wife is in heaven waiting for me right now. I uh, am looking, I'm excited about joining her before long. <laughs> and so that is the greatest accomplishment. And it, it's the only accomplishment really that matters. Yeah, well, it's been an amazing career, as we said. Let's go back a bit. Let's go back to 1960. You're in Thailand, and you saw something that had a profound impact on you. What was that? I saw three Buddhist monks immolating themselves, that is, burning themselves alive in a, like a city square with crowds of people all around watching. And, and I couldn't say hear what they were saying, but they were burning themselves alive. So I asked the Thai guide, what, what's this about? He says, well, I don't know, but they're making a plea of some sort for something that they think God wants, perhaps to feed the poor. We don't know. And they can't, can't explain it anymore because they're burning themselves alive. And I must say, uh, I, I remembered 1 Corinthians 13, if I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. And I thought, are these, these three Buddhist monks doing this for nothing? But it's their faith. It's what they were taught. Are they, They're obeying their faith. And it made me question my own faith. Do I have that kind of faith? Do I believe what I believe just because I was taught it? And I allowed myself at that time to go back to ground zero, as I recount in the book, and just start not believing anything and, and asking first, how do I know there's a God? Well, it didn't take long to settle that because I could look around and see all the evidence <laughs> that uh, th this all didn't just happen. There had to be, as Einstein and Hawking have now manifested, there is a spirit abroad. There is an intelligence we don't understand. Therefore, we just concentrate on the science that we can. They can't, they can't pronounce a three-letter word, God, as bright as they are. But I settled it for myself. God exists. Then is the Bible his divine word. Can I prove that? And I do and did. And then finally, is Jesus the son of God? And, and if both God and his word say he is, and he said he was, and he proved it over 2000 years, uh, then I knew I was on solid ground. And I pitied and prayed for those monks. But my own faith was soundly secured. Uh, from that experience. And so, Pat, your new book is very compelling. It is called If. It's a uh, very fascinating title for a book, for a memoir. Why the title If? Well, for one, you cannot ignore this. <laughs> if you see it on a bookshelf at a truck stop or wherever, looking for a book to read, uh, you're not looking for a religious book, probably. If it says religious, you won't read it. But the corners of the book which I designed look like they're, they're singed, like it was lifted out of a book burning. And that warning sign says, not religious, life or death, if the everlasting choice we all must make. And I, I believe that people across the country who are spiritually illiterate, I'm not saying that as a pejorative, it's just true according to all the polls, they don't know what God says. They don't know the Bible. That's over half of America now. And they're not going to pick up a book they consider religious. But the title, if it's if, what do you mean? The eternal choice we all must make. Well, I got to take a look at this. And that's what I hope they'll do. They're the people, over half of Americans who don't believe anymore, don't hardly know what to believe. They're the ones I'm trying to reach with the knowledge, the warning that they are making the choice about eternity now, whether they know it or not, whether they intend to or not. They are making that choice because God has left it to them. He wants them to come to heaven, and I prove that in the book. He's made it possible. It's free. They can all Anybody can be saved if he wants to be, but he leaves the choice to each individual. What is your choice? That's the if, heaven or hell. It's that stark. It's that real. It's unchanging. You can laugh. You can deny it. You can ridicule it, but it's still there. You're not changing it. And that is the truth. And Pat, in your book, it, it comes across very clearly your concern for people and their soul. I mean, it's very compelling reading. Look, something a lot of people may not know about you. You've had more than 300 
800 baptisms in your swimming pool, including, I understand, an 81-year-old woman. Why do you baptize people? Well, because Jesus said, if he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That 80-year-old woman, uh, Mary Nelson, was a Methodist, but she'd never been baptized. And she read my book, one of my books about baptizing people in our pool. And she had somebody contact me and said, would Pat Boone baptize me? I don't know if I'm saved. She came to the door. She's a sweet little lady, white haired. I sat down with her. I said, Mary, isn't it wonderful to know that you belong to Jesus? And she teared up. She says, I don't. I don't know. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> and I, feel, I hope if I'm baptized, I will know. I said, Mary, will you believe it if Jesus says it? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You believe, don't you? We're going to be baptized. What else does he say? Shall be saved. Let's go to the pool. We went to the pool. I baptized that sweet lady with her uh, hair, hair net over her, oh, her oh. hair, baptized her, buried her, raised her. When she came up out of the water, Andrew, she was so teary and joyful. She said, I know, I know. And when I met at the door, she was tearing up again. I said, what's the matter? She said, for the first time in my life, I'm 80 and I know. And one week later, she went to the Lord. Oh. We found later. She had one week of knowing in her 80 years, but I'm glad it was that last week before she met Jesus, knowing that she belonged to him. Look, I want to let people know Pat's new book is called If, The Eternal Choice We All Must Make. It's available wherever books are sold. And Pat, we want to thank you so much for being with us and being such a great friend of CBN and all the best in, in your future. Ah, thank you, Andrew. Stay with us. We'll be back with more of The 700 Club right after this. Delari was cooking when the edge of her sari caught on fire. Her back and legs were severely burned. After that, I faced a lot of difficulties. I couldn't walk, my legs had shrunk, and the skin peeled off. I gave up all hope. Delari needed surgery, but her family couldn't afford it. Then the family heard about a hospital that partners with Operation Blessing. They reached out to us, and we paid for Delari's multiple surgeries. I can walk normally without any pain. I will be forever grateful to everyone who helped me get my surgery. CBN Partners are changing lives. Your help brings food, water, and joy to families. Children learn, play, laugh, and smile again because you care. Partner with CBN. Please call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com. George and Corey have both fought for our country as Marines, but their biggest battle has been on the home front, helping their youngest daughter fight a rare disease of the pancreas. And this fight has taken a huge toll on their entire family. U.S. Marines George and Corey were not only fellow squadron members, they are husband and wife. Both were sent into battle after 9-11. I knew it was gonna change everything because females were going in. And there hadn't been females going into combat previously to this point. And so myself and a couple others were the first females to go forward into combat and actually fly. After returning from Afghanistan, they started a family. In 2018, George retired and began a new career. Just a few weeks later, their daughter Tilly was diagnosed with a rare disease of the pancreas and sent across the country to Boston to see a specialist. Living out of a hotel room for a month at a time, eating three meals a day is definitely, it definitely became a, ooh, because we're still feeding our three children at home. In addition to flights, hotels, and meals, the couple also paid for Corey's parents to fly to California to look after their other three children. We're still having to make sure that we've left everything in place for the kids to survive and to have what they need while we're still maintaining a whole nother household on another coast. Tilly stabilized and they returned home, but required multiple doctor's visits back in California, plus another trip to Boston. They prayed about what to do next. I quit my job. I had a job up in LA and it was too far away, so I just quit my job. And then uh, that way I could be there to kind of help out Tilly and, and everybody. That decision would mean a substantial loss of income. Thinking about finances was stressful. If I have to take all my savings and all my money out of my IRA and everything else, like that was gonna happen. Thankfully, the family didn't have to. 
because North Coast Church contacted Helping the Homefront. Tracy Moss invited the couple over to tell them CBN would reimburse the thousands of dollars they incurred due to Tilly's illness. We want to make sure that we get the help that you need so that you can focus on Tilly and focus on your kids. And so we want to be here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We want to help support and pay for that trip back to Boston and parents trips back here. I don't even know how to honestly to, to put it into words. It's, it's a relief, honestly. So thank you very much. This Marine family can now focus on keeping Tilly healthy without financial stress. It's going to make it easier. It takes away that stress, that worry, that burden of what if, what's next, and what do we need to do? So we can't thank CBN enough for the financial support. George and Corey have given their lives really to the defense of our country, to standing up for the principles that are America. Isn't it wonderful that you and I have an opportunity to speak into their point of need? That's the way life works, isn't it? You know, it just happens when you least expect it. It's not like you've got something set aside over here in case something goes wrong. You know, this is a family just trying to make it and trying to make it on military pay. And just want to say thank you to those of you who are 700 Club members because you make it possible for this to happen. You know, it's, it's wonderful to go up and be able to say to someone, thank you for your service or I'm praying for you. But it's also wonderful to do something so practical that it really touches and impacts their lives. That's just one of the things you do if you're a 700 Club member. So much more going on here at home and all around the world. I want to say to the rest of you, if you haven't joined yet, you are missing out on the opportunity of a lifetime. For 65 cents a day, $20 a month, you get to change people's lives. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And God calls all of us to do that, doesn't he? When someone is in need in front of you, we're to help them. We're to do something to change their situation. Why don't you join the 700 Club today? It's 65 cents a day, 20 dollars a month that's a general membership but take a look at this you've got other opportunities you could become a 700 club gold member at, eight, at 84 or 40 dollars a month or a thousand club member at 84 dollars a month our 2500 club members join us at 209 dollars a month and then our founders at 417 a month ask god what he'd have you do you can't imagine the satisfaction you'll feel when you pick up that phone and say, I want to join the 700 Club and know that immediately you're touching people's lives. And we want to say thank you for doing that by sending you Pat's latest. It's putting on the armor of God, a teaching from the book of Ephesians. And I think you're going to love this. It's our way of saying thank you. And if you'll do it using Pledge Express, that's electronic monthly giving, it saves some of the cost for administrative things that need to be done. And we can put even more of your gift right into the needs of people like George and Corey. We're going to send you, if you use Pledge Express Power for Life teaching, you'll get one every month. I think you'll love them. They're teachings we get here at CBN, and they will touch your life and make a difference. So call now. Say I want to join the 700 Club, and I'd like to do it using Pledge Express. Time for a quick question? Yeah, let's do one. Okay, this is Patricia, who sent an email question in. She said, I was wondering, when we pray, do we have to pray for a certain length of time for God to hear us? And do we pray in a certain way for our prayers to reach him? Yeah, Patricia, I, I've learned this. Maybe you can too. Take some pressure off yourself when it comes to prayer. Uh, I think it's a combination of coming to the Lord in reverence to Him because of His holiness and also an intimate way as well. You know, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's, so there's a holy reverence we come to Him with and also intimacy because of He's our Heavenly Father. And for, for those who haven't had a good experience with their dad, the biological dad, adopted dad, whatever, that can be tough for some folks. But also remember Jesus was clear. He said, don't be like a hypocrite who thinks he is heard just because of his many words, right? That's quite an instruction for us. He said, when you pray, go to your room, shut the door and meet with your father. Meet with your father who knows what is done in secret and will reward you. You know, sometimes in my prayer life, I am just pouring it out and I've got, you know, things that are on my heart that are really concerning to me and it's all me, like expressing myself. Sometimes I just try and meet with the Lord and be in His presence and I'm quiet for a while and maybe waiting for Him to speak to me. I'll speak to Him. Don't put pressure on yourself to structure it so much. What the Lord wants is fellowship with us. 
relationship and time with us. And I begin, I think you'll begin to really benefit from that time. He'll speak to you. We leave you these words from Psalm 16. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Terry and I thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.